I'm also a lecturer. Ooh, um, I'm also a lecturer in the School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies at Leeds, and yep, the primary investigator of Writing the Now. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kathleen Stewart. Kathleen Stewart writes ethnograph eth ethnographic experiments to approach the composition of emergent worldings and their modes of knowing and sensing in refrains, rhythms, voices, tactilities, misfires, labours and atmospheres. Her books include A Space on the Side of the Road, Cultural Poetics in, a, in an Other America, Ordinary Effects, The Hundreds, co-authored with Lauren Ballant, and Worlding, which is in preparation. She taught at the University of Texas, Austin. So encountering Katie is encountering overabundance, an attunement to what's going on, forming up, throwing together in mezzo or the middle of things. An encounter with Katie spirals out into the contact with the hollers, a walk to Walgreens, New England, Texas, walking the hills with her and her sister, the widow's highway, a kitchen table with toys underfoot, or sat in the car talking and laughing things over with collaborator Laura, Lauren Ballant. Encountering Katie is always an encounter with what writing can do, with composition and theory, experimentation and form, and an approach which actively mixes composition and theory. Encountering her writing prompts, mode of teaching and practice in the hundreds was a huge inspiration for the work we're doing together, which has come to result in writing the now. So Helen and I first met Katie when she floored us by agreeing to be an external examiner for my PhD thesis fiver. Coming into an encounter with her there was one of scholarly generosity, precision, critical attention, and a willingness to be dis disorientated by Northern Englishness. We then asked her to take part in today to think worlding with writing the now. And I can't think of anyone better to address the now through approaching what's plump with potential, through following out what's going on, through tracks of action and reaction, through what is generative and ongoing. So now I will pass you on to Kathleen Stewart. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm gonna be talking about this book worlding that I'm just finishing, um, trying to give you some sense of the kinds of writing and experiments in it. Um, and I'll talk for about five minutes first, and then I'll do a reading. So <clears throat> the book um, is, you know, thinking about worlding in many ways, but one way to think about it is as a prompt and one which promises and has imperatives of both form and performance. The book is about how these worlding prompts are taking place at rapid speeds now <clears throat> and have, a, and uh, you know, there are a lot of differences in what's going on, but there's a something happening there. And it's something like the feeling of a sweep is the way it's been described but, uh, by some theorists or the vitality affect of a thresholding, something pulling over a threshold into something that becomes recognizable. Um, <clears throat> its premise of the book is world first. So the theory here about the subject um, as something that is pulled out of itself by some kind of a generativity. And I'm interested in it, uh, the impersonal and I like to call the subject it. Uh, and the first thing that I do when I'm trying to write experimentally is to subtract. So here they're subtracting machinery of thinking and writing that we learn academically and otherwise normativity. So I'm subtracting the grammar of an interior subject and the objects that are somehow out there. Uh, and what has happened to me in this process is a more elemental attuning to impressions, affects, bodies, sub-threshold modulations, intuition of where a tendency might go, and probably a kind of weird realism of multiplicities pinging off each other like fireflies in a field. That's the my most fun model I like uh, from um, Bryant, 
of what a uh, what a an assemblage is <clears throat> fireflies pinging off each other in the field so here's some words um, of the kind of thing that I'm calling worlding. Bakhtin might have called it the unfinalized. For Bart, I think it was the third meaning. For Whitehead, the unfelt engine of experience kickstarting itself. For Howard Zinn, it's the history of how things could have happened otherwise. Or for Sadia Hartman, it's the fabulatory space of foreclosed possibilities. But I want to say that these are just words. They're not final concepts. And this is something that keeps happening to me as I'm making statements throughout this book. I'm, you know, reading people, I'm liking something, but it's very much in the moment of a sentence, which is how I also read theory. These are words that come up, uh, they get tried on. Concepts are experiments too, right? Um, evaluative critique is kind of my enemy here as something that stops the machinery that I'm trying to keep moving. Uh, Deleuze and Foucault both looked for forms of thought or act that expose maximum potential. And that's the ideal for me of what a system image might be in our writing, what exposes maximum potential for differing, for generativity. Okay, so then what can writing do is the question when you have this <clears throat> theory problem and this description problem. What I've done in here is I started out with sensory autoethnography as a townie in a town in Massachusetts outside of Boston. And I'll read a few pieces from that experiment. But it also became a question about the atmospheric, as many people over these past this past decade and more have been leaning into. So um, how do you approach the atmospheric? And then finally, the elemental, um, which is to me still a really interesting question of how I ended up there. And what it means to end up there and what it is exactly. Uh, but it's the, definitely the non-human. There's birds and seasons and ice and snow in the book and so on. And then finally, the fragmented and the poetic, which is really how I would say I mainly write. By subtracting words down to the poetic, condensing um, and peak picking up pieces of things. There's a lot of lists of things that don't seem to go together, that are being put together. Words here are something that reactivates something that's happening in a worlding, uh, or triggers something, voices. The word contact aesthetic will be coming up, the, that kind of concept of being in touch, which is Jean-Luc Nancy said, there's no writing that doesn't touch. I'm really interested in that word and world. Um, how can they touch? What does that mean? Um, textures and rhythms matter. Um, just some examples of the kind of experiments that are going on with this kind of thing is Alexis Paula Gums uh, has a book where she's talking about a cap racist capitalism by sidling up to the skin of sea mammals, touching uh, Fred Moten wants to be a DJ of the world. He said, why? Um, I would like to be able to think of a writing where thought doesn't have a currency to subsume singularities. So you'll see that coming up. The precision of what's actually happening in a scene, um, giving, sp giving that space rather than what Sedgwick called um, hard theory, uh, having concepts and putting it on top of things that you're encountering. So in this book, I go back and forth between different kinds of worldings in different places and times, um, all of which have some where there are possibilities and impossibilities of living that sediment or poison sills that's what I'm, so I'm very, very interested in the still life, the, the tension within a pause. So the first one is the 50s in New England and North Carolina with the wings of class, race, and gender flapping in a political economic ascendance in the U.S. 
Material practices and intimate publics in the 50s propelled liberalism's dream of a self-constituted subject in a wide world made homey in gadgets and practices of care. We'll see what that's about. For townies outside of Boston, a worlding elaborated in an elemental weight. There's a real concept of weight uh, in being a townie. Uh, but also I have this interesting image I like that being a townie is like being in a murder of crows. In the National Sacrifice Zone of the West Virginia coal fields, bodies, tongues, and the place itself directly voice an impersonal world of impacts. So worlding takes on that quality there. In Las Vegas in the late 1980s, um, the situation there bred the new ordinary in a proliferation of worldings around trauma, recreation, and other drugs, other things, sorry, including drugs, of course. Um, and this is what I call little worlds. I think this is a phenomenon that began in that place and in that time and is now way past widespread. Um, this kind of logic of proliferation of worldings in the face of a destabilization and social isolation and the breakdown of many things. And then finally, the last scene is in Austin, which I take as a heady bubble of the new economy, a wash in sensate experimentation, wealth, hipness, and a capitalist AI turn to the right. In contrast to the bubble of Austin, and there are many other bubbles, but not that many, um, a drive across the country in the US is a scene of decomposing leftovers of another era. Okay, so now I'm gonna read some pieces from Worlding. And Worlding is an experiment in approaching the present slash the emergent slash a generativity for good or bad. We're all differently feeling our way through the transitional immediacy of a charged present, unstable, damaging, made durable in the suggestion of a coherence. A novel immediacy shows up like a transmission from elsewhere. Michael Ondaji's harbor is as sincere as a Singapore cassette, but I love it here, skimming out into the night anonymous among the lazy commerce, my nieces dancing on the breakwater as they wait, the lovely swallowing of thick night air as it carves around my brain, blunt, cleaning itself with nothing but its anonymity, with the magic words, harbor, lost ship, Chandler, estuary. Words are an intimacy of substance, flesh, trope, and tone. There are crystallizations in a gregarity of elements, reservoirs of feeling, a potential in the splash of a rhythm or the pinch of a noise. A walk is a venturing out on the thread of a tune. Homeless men coming from Sunday breakfast at the church walk slow in a single file to the bus stop, not saying a word, but alert. A super yoga crowd of young women crosses their path, crisp and snappy, on their way to the Earth Mother, who wears wraps and holds eye contact. Her ex-husband, the co-founder, touches when he teaches. At Walgreens, the pharmacy tech asks the young guy ahead of me to sign a form for Sudafed and then counsels him not to take it with the Sudafed-laced allergy medication he's also buying. The customer spreads Halloween props on the counter, little scrubby black rubbery things and a, black, and a plastic pumpkin. And this was August. The whole thing a little off and only slightly interesting in a way that's now ordinary. Some things we barely notice, but that doesn't mean they're nothing. The glances, a smell in the air, cartoon figures tattooed on legs. The new ordinary is no cemetery of things gone to ground, but what's imminent in a facial tick or a smirk. Everything has the sense of a question. We tweak on forms as if they're tracks to follow, and we all have our reveals, our personal mute buttons, we feel the lore of the rabbit hole. 
The rational isn't all that. What is, is a murmuring agitation. <clears throat> Excuse me, townies, one. The subject is an exposure that doesn't return to itself. A little unhinged, it's in sync with the creative fugitivity in experience, the intervallic excess of the ordinary, the sensation of a sweep becoming informed by levels beyond itself. My brother and cousin leaned into each other at the Christmas Eve party, dropping their jaws into the town's accent, dropping their selves into a towny trance as white ethnic men who know everyone and are leading characters in and of the town. One, once captain of the high school football team, one, a drinking daredevil with the personality of a mayor. Both have voices and bodies grown ready for a sign of trouble or a giggling through line. They locked eyes and took a hard turn into a strange rapid fire recitation of what was going on on their streets. A dense litany I couldn't follow and didn't want to. Horrifying medical conditions popping up along with college acceptances, drugs, a new farmer's porch. The dreadful and a little bit of something the conscious and the unconscious, the personal and worldly suddenly conjoined in a zone of the as if, the what if, the did you see that. There was no meta plane of what to think or do, no mode of empathy or critique, just the recitation, social, physical, pre-personal and hypnotic, a thing the townies threw themselves into like a deep drink. Then, satisfied, like an itch, it was over. They nodded to each other to put a point on it and moved on to talk to the other relatives in the room in ways less precisely of towniness, but still in its atmospherics and singularities. We were all townies. We recognized the forms, the territory, the aesthetic politics, the foundational whiteness, the liberalism, the history, the labor politics, the environmentality of it all. We were all performers, but these two had honed themselves down to a townie's seasoned expressivity, digging in, in the same way that Hugh Raffles describes the artist Cornelia Hesse Honiger, going deeper and deeper into her lifelong practice of pointing, painting leaf bugs in the wake of Chernobyl, collecting them in fields and on roadsides, getting to know their ways. She would lose herself in the bugs, so intimately connected to them that it was as if she had once been one and now had a body remembering his bug life. Painting them, after studying them under a microscope, she worked mechanically, attuned to the abstract aesthetic of form, color, and angle in a distorted wing or a variation in color. Obsession and aesthetic abstraction set the path of her fabulation. She would have liked to spend a lifetime on a single specimen. My brother and my cousin, Cornelia and her bugs, locked, sensate, in a medium promising a thisness against all others. This is the form of love's madness. This is the elemental sensation of a coherence pulling what's distributed and dissolute over a threshold into something, if only for a minute. This takes chops. Every act is a worldly composition. Every ordinary percept, a way of thinking of the world's varied ways of affording itself. Nothing innocent. There's nothing innocent about any of this. In the US, the strange sensation of being in a world is the afterlife of settler colonialism, slavery, the culture wars built into the fractious hegemony of a Protestant secular state, the infrastructures of an official world that incite an orchestra of minor keys, the countless speculative patches twisting off from the paranoid to the queer utopian. In the US now, promiscuous forces are lures for feeling. A scene is a gathering of tendencies and points of contact. 
Ways of being are not a flat sum game, but an ongoing elaboration in the mode of the possible or the as if. This is a world of neither logic nor dream, but a medium of modernity's noise. I was living in the national sacrifice zone of the West Virginian coal fields when Reagan was elected. Right away, everyone knew we were in something. Right away, the story started about the people who were getting kicked off social security disability. Why her? She's a widow with diabetes, no running water, no income. Why him? He's crazy and one-legged. He's got nobody. People were turned around, as they said. Old people were buying cans of dog food for their suppers. Young people were living in cars, the baby's dirty diapers piling up in the back seat. Over time, the fast food chains in town became the only place to work. The beat up pickups went and the beat up Ford Escorts came. When the idea hit that another generation of the young would have to leave to find work in the cities, parents prepared their girls by training them in martial arts. So now there are a lot of black belts in Cincinnati. Walmart happened, Oxycontin happened, tourism didn't happen, Falwell's moral majority didn't happen either. The little metal stands full of pamphlets appeared in the back of the churches, but after years of standing there untouched, they faded away. Nothing is ever just personal, but more than my damn self, as, as Harney and Moten put it, force registers in a praxis of inhuman intimacies. Experience lodged in the history of the present registers not as a simple recognition of what is, but as a disruption in an infrastructure, a stutter in a flow. What happens is ambient and therefore atmospheric, not just in the air, but of the air. Barometric pressure is atmospheric, but so is an October mountain, an opening in a situation, an aesthetic presenting in paint, clouds, a swagger. You find yourself in an atmosphere when you walk into a cloud of smells or if you live in a toxic place. BP's remediation of its oil spill with poisonous chemicals shows up in a rainbow sheen on water flooding a sidewalk where children are playing. One morning, returning to Boston shortly after my father's death, I woke to a precisely familiar composition of air, light, and sound. Men working on trees in the street on a crisp day called out to each other in a joking intimacy. It was my father's towny voice, its timing and phrasing, the barely suppressed giggle, the way it traveled across the street. Critique now tries to lean away from all the issues of academic thought to show up instead for the all the not nothings that take gymna some gymnastics to think. Drop the mimetic ambitions of a thinking subject trying to represent a world per se, and it matters that something was yellow, that it passed in a blur, that the thawing ice on a lake moans. In a politics of incipiency, Big forces compose worlds, but so does swimming or an odd encounter on a city street. Tanahisi Coates felt out the racial fear tra transmogrifying into rage, quote, in the music that pumped from boomboxes full of brand boast and bluster, in the girls, their loud laughter, how they squared off like boxers, Vaselined up, earrings off, Reeboks on, and lunged at each other, unquote. An agitation finding its mark is a vivid pragmatics. Misrecognized, it can also be deadly. In a political moment, we feel the overclosseness of the world. The poetry of matter passes into compounds of sensation. Words aren't captions or descriptions of what is, but an intuitionist's improv on what might be or could be happening in a scene's dilations condensations and clogs. At Fort Hood, deployment is in the air in the form of PTSD, infidelity, death by speeding at the widow's highway, the day after getting home, the dull sense of propriety on the base. It sutures to the mile long row of strip malls, fast food chains and auto parts stores, 
10 miles of tanks and then nothing, the open prairie of tornado country. We try to sync up to what's happening, like Andre Debus's bouncer watching for pockets of possible trouble in a strip club. Quote, you can feel in the details of those dark human spaces in the room where something has just changed. A man lets out an appreciative yell where before he was silent. One of the dancers out on the floor laughs a little too hard or steps back too fast. A chair leg scrapes the carpet. A shift of objects in the space. A change in the air. Unquote. Townies, too. Nothing, once materialized, is ever neutral. I drank and smoked for the first time when I was 15. Walking home down Elm Street, I took a pee on an elm tree. I sat down on a granite curb. The night posed roof lines and bushy shapes. An engine revved down the block. A window slammed in the near distance. It was a white girl, Irish Catholic, towny moment in a place where ethnicities aligned partially and not without violence of their own against the Yankee establishment. Once, it was a bright spring day. I found myself going door to door with a petition for the ABC program, a better chance to bring some so-called inner city high school boys to live in an old manse on Elm Street and attend the high school, which was far from a good school, if you ask me, but somehow was coming up smelling like roses in this rickety concept of equal opportunity. I stood on stoops looking around at the colorful flowers in yards. I remember a front door opened. I said I had a flyer. Some old person slammed the door in my face. The ABC concept cut a crude humanist swell in the contours of living. ABC, ABC, ABC was a vibration passing into a sensation. Language stammered. 10 boys came, there was dancing in the basement. My sister says it was no coincidence that the boys played basketball and the house parent, Mr. Russo was the coach. She also remembers blackface performances in the high school auditorium at some point earlier. My aunt remembers as a kid in the 30s throwing rocks at a Lebanese woman who was walking up the hill from her factory job carrying bags of groceries for her six kids. She says that was a different time. What makes a time different? Every worlding has its imperatives. Jazz musicians are supposed to smoke pot. Graduate students learn how to please their professors. Camden in 1971 was forefronts, storefronts permanently closed, houses vanishing first behind the telltale of wood and neighborhood tags, then in fire, smoke, or wrecking ball. The subject, already riven, multiplied, and amplified by its own strange and continuous efforts to emerge, takes on the existing knowledge in an eye roll. Like method actors in a script nobody exactly wants, but everyone somehow tacitly agrees to. We mumble how you do into a stranger, elaborate on whatever comes to mind in a pause. Al Pacino built a character by following some guy around, mimicking his gait. It could be that there was a moment when the wholesale performativity of everything became pervasive. Thomas de Zengotita said the Kennedy assassination did it in the US as if the sharp sincerity crack of a gunshot cut a new course. Or some say modernism do it, did it or the industrialization of experience or we think of the hard compositional leans of the 50s or the 30s or the moment when capitalism took the throne as the medium of the senses or the way the computational calibration of every little thing now prompts an intuition of the imminent. If politics is a labor of finding your footing in the nervous system of a world, a vertigo training in incoherence, inconvenience, distraction, and diffusion, then what's its realism? What's the prefigurative politics of watching events unfold? 
anticipatory, intuitive, and amplifying rather than predictive and calculative. One morning, we sat in Sylvie's kitchen down Tommy Creek Holler, facing out the small window between flowered curtains to a curve in the road below. Stray dogs scavenging, the wood-burning cooking stove still firing from the green and blue eggs cooked in bacon fat, biscuits cut with the tin can she'd kept since she and Matt Riley got married. The oilcloth lining the wall dripped sweat. The air was so thick we could hear ourselves pulling it in. An old man opened the door without a knock, walked through the shotgun kitchen and sat down without a word, like an actor entering a stage without a cue. There was a long pause. Then Sylvie said, he's had that woman in there from over Lily. They said she was nice to talk to. Well? Well, they got into it real bad down there. They said he had her chained to the stove and she got away and got in the road. Well, and are they still in there? Oh, I don't have no idea, but they took him away. There's smoke in the chimney. There sure is. We sat re-watching the speculative reel. A worlding is a tunneling and an unsettling that animates, that animates, sorry, not because it's a given, but because it elicits a virtual mapping. Little worlds. Las Vegas in the late 80s was the beginning of something in the US. No one knew their neighbors. Everyone had unlisted phone numbers. Schools were already year round. Everything was already drive through and little worlds were already proliferating around anything recreational, identitarian or painful. The German walking club, the Toyota 4x4 off-road trekking club, casino dance teams, color therapy groups, gun collecting and bodybuilding groups and so on. In the 2000s in Austin, talking with strangers about what they were into, the questions turned basic. How'd you get into that? What is that? The mode was not surprised, was surprised not because worldings were secret or exclusive, but because something happens when the details of something you didn't even know was there are suddenly somehow at hand. You learned to catch a passing quip or to turn your head away. There were triggers, experiments in sociality, redemption dreams, public feelings of humor, sarcasm, or rage, forms of cocooning. You got a certain kind of cancer or a dog. Anything could feel like something you were in. You had started to live a sexuality or your job at Walmart took on the added bullshit of being an associate in a team. You lived the violence of race. One day you noticed you were one of those women with kids suffering from anger illness, an epidemic of unknown origins and implications. You became homeless or transgendered, or you were from some place. Anything could be a chance for absorption or repulsion, and there were always pockets of things left hanging in the air. Then teenagers started living off life hacks as if that was world enough for them. Little worlds became tiny moments like potholes people fell into. Now you're one of those people into cold water plunges because some guy on social media modeled that as a way of living, or you're in a world where you use a certain kind of plastic container for leftovers or save your quarters for the laundromat or a rainy day. Then news comes that plastic is carcinogenic and in baby's DNA, but maybe only some kinds. In the material course of morphing forces, horizon making capacities and ongoing histories of injustice, your own history of forms can be a defeat as well as company. The state you're in is the state you're in, but it's also a fine tuning that propels. Hard one attachments can be hard to get out of once you're in. That's why even the most desperate of circumstances are not just constraints, but petri dishes of compulsion and creation. For Jack in Roxana Robinson's cost, heading out to cop was like struggling through high grass. After using the landscape had a languorous plenitude, junk, smack, brown sugar, snow, horse, downtown, spread its measureless presence, dark and rich and deep, Miles of black velvet lay just inside it, 
a secret universe. He could not imagine living anywhere but where he lived or doing what he was doing. Beyond the sparkle zones. Five years ago, I drove across country. An hour in, the landscape suddenly dropped out of the sparkle zone of Austin into a surprise desolation. The bubble of the so-called new economy, population pouring in, architectural pop, foodie yoga paradise, candy bar delivery in the middle of the night, stopped as abruptly as the edge of the simulated world in the Truman Show. The cliches of a downturn were surreally written into matter in vast empty parking lots, even the gas station gone, and way down the, at the end where you could barely see it, a failing Chinese restaurant. A racially mixed no man's land extended to the horizon, towns still gesturing at the utopia of a church that works, a specialty coffee shop called Espresso Yourself, or the feminine pomp in a store selling ice cream, crab and Evelyn lotion and handmade cloth shoulder bags. That was the summer that rural teenage work died because households with money were bending their kids to the tasks of beefing up their SAT scores and getting internships. And for the poor, there was no infrastructure of work. How would they get there? Who would want them? In the new ordinary, everything has a job, but not necessarily people. Aspirational routines memorialized on TikTok as salad bowls and to-do lists break up the day into short repetitive intervals made mesmerizing and regimented in an odd exchange between intimacy and impersonality. When I got back to the city, I went to too many movies. My brain sparkled with images touching matter one film dropped me back to, into the 70s in Austin, even though I wasn't there. That house on Mary. Nothing looks like that anymore. It was rough then. People in bars were characters. They had to film it in Baton Rouge, which still looks like that in places. Coming out of the theater, I saw a line of hundreds of happy young women waiting to meet a tiny 50-something woman wearing a long yellow dress under hot star lights. I now remembered coming in, seeing a larger than life mural of Margot Robbie playing Tanya Harding, but I still had to ask one of the happy young women who they were lining up for, Tanya Harding. For real? The real one? I watched her posing for selfies. She seemed a little jumpy, oscillating between states like a blur. I'm a star now? Are they making fun of me? Am I famous? Infamous? A redneck? Her image body floated in a saturation that hinted. A real speculatively encountered is a virtual lineup of all the potentia pinging off a body, a cell phone, a lobby. Rough. We're in a rough mood. Normativity, normativity's fantasy has grown long in the tooth. Arcane, bizarre, cult-like, it's a drunken affect at a dinner party orchestrating what's already decomposed into a ring, a bow in the hair, a series of stupid jokes, a weird attachment to sitting next to your partner. Meanwhile, micro wars bloom over details. In Texas, the sociopaths run the government. Mad little worlds inflamed by liberalism's incessant judgments spin out over who goes into bathrooms or the right to eat genetically modified food. Yard signs for science, truth, racial justice are met by Vax the Jews signs over highways. A Santa Cruz neighborhood cult against leaf blowers goes viral and initiates a counter cult, cult for leaf blowers. Liberalism's problem. The liberal self is a bourgeois state of mind with a legacy admission policy and, no and is no match for all of this. It's the kind of baby that learns to identify my nose here, that's a truck, there's a cat moving by, where's mama? It's an eighth grade habit of critical thought that never grows up. 
Its truths are a restart for its own dead ends, like a floundering academic dinner party where someone says she would never cook with Campbell's cream of mushroom soup and everyone agrees as if that's an achievement. In a Connecticut library, a meeting has been called to address Trumpist racism. Two smart women share a skill set called cultural humility. The racists are not in the room, but stories of internalized racism and encounters with racist others produce educable moments to be deployed. A man from Kenya says once and then again later, or you could just talk to people, calling up a generative sociality the room can't quite hear. Conclusion. It's not critique's rough handling of what's wrong with the world we need now, but an attunement to the weird generativities and meanwhiles lodged, launched, and deforming in the broken realism of ongoing histories of dehumanization and foreclosure. For me, the riff of a sentient mind attuning to fragments and personae is a heaven built of worldly bits. Something shows up like an affirmative action for the formless. In the midst of drugs, travel, a mountain, a scene becomes a little luminescent. A hawk staring down at a chihuahua in a backyard or the tendency to excess in a voice getting loud. Affective structures wait what's still cutting together and apart in a paradigm of suggestion. The empirical swells to intuit possible worlds as prisms refracting, not models representing. We ready ourselves form watching videos of an eagle's nest in the Rockies or the package thieves on the porch. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that, Katie. That was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think what we'll do now is to move towards a little bit of writing ourselves. Um, so the context behind this um, being that Writing the Now is a program devoted to writing, critical and active approaches to form. So it makes sense for us as the audience members to do some as well. So. Um, when we asked Katie to join us, um, we asked if she'd be interested in giving us a prompt, something to work through. Um, so I'll turn that over to Katie to describe now. Okay, thanks. I was thinking, and I meant to say this before, that it would be interesting to think about what a post-humanist scene is. So uh, scene as just something that you can think about, but rather than think about uh, composing it in terms of meaning or uh, human consciousness or intention or agency or those kinds of questions. Just start with making lists of the elements in whatever scene you're imagining. Um, they can be, you know, people, but also many other things, material things, animals, atmospheres, um, and here I think about, for myself, a gregarity of elements. How are the elements in the thing that you're looking, thinking about um, somehow uh, pinging off of each other or uh, interrupting each other or making noise um, that you can intuit? Uh, and then uh, who are you? what's happening to you as you're making these lists of the scene. Uh, and here, just to return to the townies example, I called that being like being in a murder of crows. There's something collective, there's something um, material. Uh, it's very sensory and it's also weirdly impersonal from a you know, a humanist perspective or a human perspective, even though it's all about humans, of course. So I guess they want you to just write for 10 or 15 minutes if possible, making these, in this case, lists or whatever it is that you get into as you start to write. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Katie. So um, what we'll do is we'll start, uh, we'll stop the recording now, if you could, please, Helen.